Hey everybody, welcome back to Super Taku Bros. Once again, I am your host, uh, Joel Munnis. As usual, I am joined by my cousin and good friend, John. Hey everybody, how you doing? And today we're going to try uh, something a little different. Now that we've done deep dives on two shows, and we're pretty much up to where everybody else is at the moment, uh, we're going to segment the show into uh, parts. And uh, we're going to call them Superhero Time. And Rider Time, Superhero Time being the part of the show that's dedicated to Super Sentai, and Rider Time being the part of the show that's dedicated to Common Rider. And if we have time at the end, we'll talk about movies and video games and stuff, but as I've stated in previous episodes, this show is fairly Taku-based. If anything else piques our interest, um, like the new Ultraman that's coming out on uh, Netflix, we might talk about that in one episode, but for the most part, it's going to be Sentai and Rider-based. So, to start things off, let's start Superhero Time! Superhero time. To start off, we're going to talk about Ryu Soldier. We just got introduced to that uh, last week. Let's talk about the first episode. So, was okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, John does not care for Sentai. Uh, go ahead. It was not the worst that I've ever seen, but it wasn't the best. Well, considering you've seen practically none of it... You don't have a whole lot to base it on other than Power Rangers, and Power Rangers is kind of like a horrible bastardization of most things Sentai. True, but I've still seen better Power Rangers than that. Wow. Tough crowd. Tough crowd. Talking about the first episode, what we're going to do um, in this format is we're going to do what I did for the Super Sentai Strongest Battle. We're going to break up the episode, and we're going to talk about each part, and then at the end of the episode, we're going to talk about our final thoughts. So let's start with breaking down the episode. Um, we start the episode seeing a changing of the guard, where um, the past red, pink, and blue rangers are giving their powers to the new red, blue, and pink rangers, so those guys can start protecting the tribe. I actually kind of liked that a little bit. It was it was neat. And what's interesting about that is if you guys saw our, or listened to our last episode, we were talking about Super Sentai Strongest Battle. That actually led directly into this. Because the guy we saw in the cave in the last episode of Super Sentai Strongest Battle, who grabbed that like orange Ryu soul and made it a Red Ranger one, he is actually the master of the current Red Ranger, and the current Red Ranger is his apprentice. So we see him taking that thing he got from Super Sentai Battle and giving it to the new Red Ranger so now he can morph. And our Rangers' names are Ko for the Red Ranger, Metalo for the Blue Ranger, who actually has blue hair, and it's an obvious wig. It's very bad. And it's pretty it's pretty horrible. Yeah. And and the Pink Ranger's name is Asuna, which I actually like because of Sword Art Online. Yeah, she was she was cute. Yeah, she's kinda of cute. After that whole ceremony's over, it cuts to a giant monster walking through the forest. And it's kinda of like foreshadowing as shit's about to go down. And after that, they cut to uh, what appears to be a video blogger um, claiming she's in the Amazon, where she's clearly not in the Amazon. <laughs> she's in a fucking Japanese forest, but she's like, hey, everybody, look at me. I'm in the Amazon. I'm all cool and shit. Those up close camera shots. Uh, be anywhere. Oh, God, that was. Yeah, yeah, I guess. And then for like a split second, Ko pops around her corner and is like, the hell you doing? <laughs> and then he instantly disappears <laughs> his master basically grabbed him pulled him back and uh we find out at this moment that they live in like a secret like city forest thing um if any of you guys have seen uh ginga man it's very 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 similar to ginga man because john you it's uh power rangers lost galaxy over here but yeah in ginga man they literally lived in a hidden forest city and you could only be um in the city is if you were taken by somebody who lives there like it's almost an alternate dimension kind of thing and they kind of hint to uh the ryu soldier people being in a very similar situation that's why like when uh ko's master grabbed him he was boom instantly nowhere to be fucking seen yeah it was it was kind of weird because later on in the episode when they're escorting a to check out, there's like a sign that says like, you know, it says like National Park on it or something like that. Well, I, I think 
I think she stumbled in there. You know what I mean? It's it, apparently it's not like Gingham in because you just, just flat out could not get in there. But um, we'll we'll get that happens later in the episode. Like I said, we're gonna do it piece by piece. She's basically our comic relief. Uh, I think Bulk and Skull, which is kind of disappointing because I don't think Japanese Power Rangers needs a Bulk and Skull, but they sure as fuck got one. And uh, she is walking through the forest, and she gets attacked by the foot soldiers of this series, who kind of look like knights, and it's kind of cool, keeping with, with with the motif. Yeah, I was kind of thinking like Queen of Hearts, like Alice in Wonderland thing. When yeah, I saw yeah, I see that, I see that. Um, and during the fight, Red and his master come out, and we find that his master can also become a ranger at the same time. He doesn't even need a morpher. Yeah, I wonder about that, too. I was like, uh, what? Yeah, I thought that was actually kind of cool. Like, it, it's showing you that, like, being a ranger isn't just, like, morpher related in here. Like, it's part of their tribe. It's part of their society. And, like, their guardians were always rangers. And even though, like, they pass the powers down... I guess they have the power until they die type of thing. That's kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, but then it's like, what's the point of the soul if you can just become a ranger without it? Well, I think to initially get the powers, you need the soul. I think that's what they were trying to hint to. Like, these guys have had the powers so long that they don't need the soul anymore. Like, that's part of who they are. Yeah. But anyways, uh, the battle between the two reds and the foot soldiers proceed. And we see the Red Ranger using the gimmick of the series called Ryu Souls. Now, if you guys didn't see or listen to my last episode, basically a Ryu Soul is kind of like a Ranger Key from the Gokaiju or Power Rangers Super Mega Force. And um, it, it flips down, and when it's flipped down, it looks like a dinosaur head or um, kind of like a reptilian head. And when it flips up, it's like your traditional Ranger Key. But it looks like a knight, and the knight is holding a sword or a hammer or some sort of weapon symbolizing the power that you will get by using it. And when they use it, they put it into their swords. Because, like, at the top of the hilt of the sword is a dinosaur head. And they open its mouth, they put the ranger key inside it, or Ryu Soul. We're just gonna, we should probably keep calling them Ryu Soul, sorry. Anyways, to put the Ryu Soul in it, they make a chomping motion, and then the power manifests as armor on the ranger's arm. Now, what did you think about that? I thought that was kind of cool, John. I did, too. Uh, I thought the gimmick was nice. I like the way the swords look, too. Yeah, the swords are really cool. I, I love, like, the jagged edge on one side. It's yeah, really... it's supposed to be, like, the spine of the... Yeah, of yeah, I see that. Yeah, like the spine of a, a dinosaur or something. That's That's really cool. I like what they did with that. Yeah, I liked it a lot. Well, like I said, during the fight, the Red Ranger uses one of these Ryu souls, and this particular power um, apparently gives him like a big old power boost, makes him stronger, and he defeats the foot, foot soldiers in a really flashy, explosive manner. Which was weird because then they transition into another fight where he just like, you know, fighting them normally. I'm like, why didn't he just murder these guys like he did the last ones? Well, I mean, they don't do that right away. I mean, what, what are you referring to, dude? Because I don't remember that. So he fought. He, like, the knights come out. He instantly murder balls them. Mm -hmm. And then the next time they fight him, it was, like, not too much, too, too, not too longer. Excuse me. It was not much longer after that. Mm -hmm. And then they fight him. And he's like, I'm like, why don't you just do what you did the first time and just one hit KO them? Well, he didn't. I think you're remembering it wrong, John, because I literally just watched the episode, and he didn't. they didn't fight the foot soldiers again like the Red Rangers didn't. The next time the Red Rangers fought, they were fighting that tank dude. No, he fought him he, the first time in the, the forest where he, like, one-shot him, uh -huh. and, then he, and then he fought him again. So, quick update to the fight between me and John. I just re-watched the episode, and John is full of shit. That fight never happened. Anyways... Back to Super Taku Bros. Right after that fight, and after he wins, we're um, introduced to the two uh, main generals of the series that we're going to see right now. Um, Creon, which kind of looks like this monster mushroom thing that's covered in slime. and it looks like a rabbit. I get Well, it has a mushroom top for a head. Yeah, but it, like the face kind of gives me that bunny feeling. 
Okay, I see that. And then uh, Tankju, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, who basically looks like a monster castle thing, and that definitely fits with the night vibe, I think. I really like that. Yeah, he, he actually looks pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think his design fits the motif, and I think, like, uh, Creon's design is kind of neat because it, it almost looks like elfish, so it kind of feels like something that could exist during, like, medieval times, I guess you could say. Yeah. So after they're done introducing us to um, those two, they show us uh, Yui, who is the comic relief chick. They show us her dad, and apparently he's in on the whole fake YouTube vlog channel. And uh, they basically reinforce that dynamic that these two are going to be the comic relief. Like, they have this stupid exchange where she's like, I'm not going to get home in time to make dinner. You're going to have to do it yourself. And he's like, damn it. Yeah, he's like, you gonna take the bus? He's like, no, I'm taking riding my bike. He's like, oh. <laughs> he's like, no, I have to be the woman. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, after they're done with the stupid comic relief, they cut to, back to the village where we see the village elder, and he gives us exposition. So the exposition is basically this, okay? Back during the time of dinosaurs, um, the Ryu Soul Clan existed, which is a form of humans that have the ability to become Ryu soldiers. And um, during that time, these aliens called the Druid Druidons, uh, appeared. Druidon, so it's, yeah. that's about right. Yeah, the Druidons, they appeared, and they were seemingly trying to take over the planet. And that's why the Ryu soldiers existed back then, to fight them off. And they created, like, the mechs and stuff, and that's basically where they got their powers. Well, if anybody knows, you know, the history of dinosaurs, eventually the comet comes and wipes all... The dinosaurs, well, the druid, the druidons uh, didn't want anything to do with that shit, so they bounced. They're like, nope, we're good. And uh, Which is weird, because somehow the people survived. Yeah, that doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense either, but hey, it's, it's sentai logic, whatever. Because, you know, it was 65 million years ago and there were people running around. Well, just these particular people, the Ryu Soul Tribe. Yeah, you know, we just skipped Neanderthal, went straight to Power Rangers. Sure, why not? Makes sense to me. So uh, the reason they give for coming back now, like millions and millions of years later, is apparently they decided they want to get the power that the Ryu soldiers used to de defend uh, the planet years ago, which they basically got from this temple where the Zords hold, are held. And the Zords are called uh, Kiryusu, I think. Yeah, yeah, Kiryusu. Right. And they were cre created <coughs> by the Ryu soul tribe, like, Millions and millions of years ago, and they lay dormant inside this temple. So basically, it, it's kind of like the temple is their morphing grid, I guess you could say, where they, their powers generate from. And without that temple and the Zords, you know, inside it, they can't morph and their powers don't exist. After all that exposition, they cut to nighttime, and we have a fun uh, moment with the three rangers bonding and asana shows us how freakishly strong she is by shoving ko like 20 fucking feet away into a rock like it was nothing it's probably the best part of the show actually yeah it, it was great dude she just does this classic like go away shove and you just see like this explosion in the rock wall and he's just gone <laughs> all right well he's dead <laughs> yeah pretty much but he, he gets up and shakes it off like it's nothing. And at this point, uh, we find Yui has snuck into the city. And that we also find out that other people have in the past. And whenever they do, they get their memories erased. <laughs> yeah, and like they so have to drag her to like the edge of the forest. And he's about to beat her in the head with a sledgehammer. <laughs> there, no, no, no. It's not a sledgehammer. It's their memory eraser. <laughs> I'm sure it'll erase her memory real good after she's dead. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But uh, before Ko can erase Yui's memories, uh, a Minosaur attacks. That, that... Thank God. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the three new rangers and their masters, who, like I said, can morph too, which is fucking awesome. I'm sorry. I like that. That really does give us a Master and Apprentice vibe. Um, take on the massive monster. And... Uh, Ko and his master uh, decide they need to run into the temple and activate the uh, Zords so uh, they can stand a fighting chance because this monster is like your classic monster to a huge size. 
And as you were saying earlier, before we started recording this episode, uh, John was saying that it basically looks like um, your classic Godzilla type monster. And I'll put up a screenshot. You guys will be able to see if you're actually watching. Yeah, it looked a lot like a, a specific Godzilla monster. I can't remember his name. Dude, uh, don't ask. I, I know like uh, Mothra and Rodan and shit like that, but I don't know most of the other names. Yeah, I don't either. But anyways, uh, the guy, the the pink and blue guys outside uh, seem to have stopped the monster for a minute. And using the power of the Ryu souls, you know, they, they knock him down and uh, they wrap a chain around him with a ball at the end. And it, the ball grows huge and just gravity wells him down to the ground. And just when it seems like they're winning, boom, there goes their powers. They instantly do more. Someone has breached the temple. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Yeah, I thought the uh, the ball and chain was pretty neat, but then I was like, that's too easy. Yeah, of course it's too easy, because they yeah. they won for, like, not even two fucking seconds. They yeah, win. not even two seconds. Yeah, and then, boom. So, with somebody in the temple, and the temple getting attacked, they instantly demorph. They still have power to the Ryu souls, because the Ryu souls get their powers from a different energy source, apparently. But uh, the power to morph, gone. So... Uh, we cut to the uh, Ko and his master in the temple fighting Tenchu with Kriyu in the background just kind of watching like, <laughs> you're going to get your ass beat now. <laughs> and without being able to morph, Tenchu just fucking wipes the floor with them. Yeah, it was a pretty pretty easy win. Yeah. And uh, Tenchu... Uh, go ahead. Gigan is the name of the, the kaiju monster that I'm thinking of from uh, Godzilla. I was looking it up. I will have to find a screenshot or a picture of Gigan and put it up there for you guys to see. But anywho, moving on. So, um, so like I said, Tanchu wipes the floor with them. They're on the ground, down for the count. And doing something I didn't expect, he, he goes in for the killing blow. And he's about to fucking myrtleize the Red Rangers. And the Red Ranger, uh, the Red Ranger's master, uh, not wanting Ko to die, as quickly as he can, he grabs Ko's sword, throws a Ryu soul on it that turns Ko's body into like something as hard as diamond, deflecting the blow. But his master takes the full force of the attack, terminally injuring him. Yep, but and I was like, why didn't he just get behind the guy made of diamonds? That makes sense, but at the same point, like. That threw me for a loop. I was like, what the fuck just happened? Like, I, I didn't... figured something like was like this was going to happen. I didn't, though. That was really surprising to me because that's not, like, usually a Sentai trope of, like, killing somebody in the first episode. Like, I'm talking about three people gagging. Well, we, we haven't got there yet. But, um, yeah, that was just so jarring to me to see him, like, die. And as John was saying, uh, we cut to... The outside of the temple, where Meto, Mel, Melto and Asuna and their two masters are trying to keep the Minosaur busy, and the Minosaur prepares like this fucking huge fire breath, and the two masters push their pupils out of the way, taking the full force of the attack, and getting wiped off the face of the fucking planet. Like you thought, seeing Ko's master die was intense. This was like, holy shit. Yeah, when uh, they would push him out of the way, I was like, yep, that's uh, the end for them. But I kind of figured that that was going to happen, too, seeing how the uh, the old Red Ranger got got, too. Yeah, but, I mean, I, I get where your logic comes from, but at the same point, it, it was jarring, dude. I didn't expect that shit at all. Like, Yeah, well, I guess I don't watch too much Sentai, so I don't really ex know what to kind of expect from the whole series. Well, it's, you know, normal stuff. Yeah, you're more used to uh, Kamen Rider where people dying isn't so much of a big thing. Like, shit, look at the end of Build. I know. There's the whole series of Build, to be honest. It's like, people just keep getting murdered left and right. But in, in Sentai, that's not a regular thing that happens, especially in the first fucking episode, man. Like, I was, like, blown the freak away. I, I didn't... Wow. But... They, uh, they probably just had to go ahead and get all their murder balling out of the way. I guess so. But anyways, uh, cutting back to Ko, with his master dying in his arms, he says, their souls are one. And it seems that it's true in the way that 
his master just fucking disappears and joins with Ko's Red Ranger Ryu soul, giving yeah. giving Ko the ability to morph one again. It uh it also gave him what a nice little little power up. Yeah, I think it made his like Red Ranger powers a little bit stronger. Like you could kind yeah. of feel that. And or, or right. the yeah, it, like when the little necklace glowed red. Yeah. And we can assume at this point, like blue and pink's masters did the same thing, because otherwise those two aren't going to be able to morph for shit either. Yeah, I mean that's what I would assume happened. Yeah. So with uh, Ko's power restored and his new vigor and determination after seeing his master freaking get murdered in front of him, uh, he brings the fight to Tankju hard. And uh, during this fight, the Minotaur finally starts to bring down the tempo temple. And Ko is uh, transported into uh, what's going to be the Megazord to save him from the collapsing temple. He he also gets transported in there by himself. So I'm wondering if that's going to be the normal. Like, there's only one dude that needs to be in it. I don't know. I mean, I, I liked his cockpit. His cockpit was really cool looking. And I, I like how he put the sword in, like, basically what looked like a dinosaur tail and stuff to activate it. Yeah, and... uh. I guess it was kind. Of, it's kind of like how they did in the uh, the Aqua Rangers, where like you, they stood up. Oh no, I guess it wasn't. Which one was it? No, I'm thinking about uh, that Gundam. What's it called? Uh, G Gundam. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, no, they've G-Gundam. done they've done this in Sentai a couple times, where it's like they're not really in a cockpit; they're just kind of standing around. And they've been yeah. doing that in Power Rangers a lot ever since um, Samurai. Like they don't actually have a cockpit anymore; they just stand around and do moves and shit. And um, it, they don't do that nearly as often in, in uh, Sentai, but it, in, like I said, in Power Rangers now, ever since the Saban era, that's been a staple. Yeah, we also didn't get a sick uh, Megazord transformation either, so... Well, uh, still, the way they introduced him was really awesome, because like, from the crumbling temple, boom, pops, pops the Megazord in all its glory, just standing there like, come at me, brah. Yeah, but I mean, they still gave us like a good morphing sequence, but like I thought the Megazord is like half the show. Yeah, well, they're not known for like showing us everything in the first episode. We'll probably get a decent like Megazord sequence in the next episode, more than likely. Yeah, I'm sure. But anyways, we learned that uh, at least the Tyrannosaurus sword this season is coherent because it's talking to uh, Ko while he's in the top cockpit, and uh, they're. They don't usually do like sentient zords too terribly often, but when they do, it's it's. I think it's more fun, you know, because now it's not just like, hey, we're controlling this robot. It's like, hey, we're a team, you know. This is my buddy and shit like that. Yeah. Um, but anyways, uh, the fight scene, in my opinion, was freaking epic. It was I'm, very fast paced. Yeah, and and that's not. We even see the Megazord freaking wall running on a mountain range. Yeah, I was wondering about that, too. I was like, man, why do they always do more damage than the monster? Dude, I thought that was freaking sweet. and It was cool. It was cool. But I'm like, man, think of all the things on the side of that mountain that are just getting squished. Uh, eh. But I, I, li- I also really liked the fact that there wasn't, like, a shit ton of CG to this. I mean, there was some for, like, the special attacks, but for the most part, it was all practical effects. And yeah. I'm old school. I love practical effects. I mean... I, I think those are the best because, like, it's something real and tangible, and it just looks better in my eyes. You know what I mean? Yeah. The only thing that bothers me about the Megazord is the little drills. Oh, like yeah, because at one point he's doing this jumping attack, and pieces and parts of him that are drills pop off and come onto his knees as he, like, knees the guy in the face. But that's going to be part of the gimmick is, like, pieces and parts of him moving and changing because of the whole Lego shit. Yeah, I'm fine with the the gimmick. I just don't like the little drills. They look silly. Fair enough. But after the battle is over, and obviously the Red Ranger wins, uh, the three Kiryusu undo their combination and appear in all their CGI glory. <laughs> they were very, very CGI glory. Yeah, like, after all that practical effects, then it's, like, blatantly obvious, not too terribly great CG. It's just like, oh... oh. That's that's just a downgrade. That's a disappointment. Well, I, I guess they have to, you know. 
whatever. Um, so anyways, the, the elder comes out and explains that red, blue, and pink are now like the official guardians of the city. And, uh, they're going to be their official re ranger, I mean, re soldiers since like the masters are dead. Like they're the only ones there who can defend the city and potentially the world from the, the bad guys. And we yeah, also, and then he comes back and he mentions about the, the green and black ranger had left. And went off to do their own thing. Right, and they've been gone for a good long while. Like, I don't, we don't even see, like, the green and black's masters, so. I assume they died, too. Well, either they died, or, um, I'm thinking since, like, they're not even part of the, uh, city anymore, I, I think what their thing is, is they're a little bit more liberal. Like, they're just, like, go off and do your own thing, and they don't freaking care. They just let green and black just go. Maybe. But one thing that struck me as really, really odd and I didn't particularly care for was, like, after all this, we see Ko, for no apparent reason, just demorph and then remorph very forcefully. Like, it felt way out of place with his comrades. It just – it felt really unnecessary and just kind of stupid. Like, why? Yeah. But I think – well, they needed that – they needed the together morphing sequence because we never got that. Yeah, but it was it solely wasn't fucking necessary. I mean, it was it was beyond forced. I mean, it's just like we're just morphing to morph. There's no threat. I, I I just thought it was it wasn't necessary. It was beyond unnecessary and stupidly forced. Like almost everything else, even the stupid sillier parts, felt like okay, this is part of the show. But that there was totally unprovoked, totally unnecessary, just showing off what the morph looks like to show it off. I'm fine with it. I mean, the show literally went off five seconds later. Yeah, and then uh, they did the... No, the dumbest part of the show is this little dance they do in the credits. Now, now you don't know this, John. You're not like a regular Sentai guy, but that is kind of a staple for Sentai. They've been doing that shit for years. It's They, skip, they only skip it every so often... Like, Lupin versus Pat, they didn't do it. But the series before it did it, they almost always have an end theme dance dance along. Like, that, that is a staple because it's definitely a kid's show. And they think kids will get up, dance with the Rangers, and, you know, get the, some sort of cardio and shit like that. Maybe. No, no, that that's not maybe. That's for sure. Like, that's the whole reason they do it. And it's it's just – it is kind of agonizing to watch. <laughs> Yeah, I literally turned it off immediately. I was like, nope. <laughs> yeah, and the song is very, like, samba-based. You know, it, it definitely has um, a it's cute... like, very happy song. Yeah. It's it's definitely, like, a Q-Ranger vibe to it. But with the episode over, now let's go to the segment I like to call Final Thoughts. Okay, so for my final thoughts, where to begin? Well, I I really like the suit designs like the the helmets feel very knight-ish with the metal grating over the visor and the fight scenes were good well filmed and very flashy and fun to watch i did like the suits and i, I did like i do like when they use their keys on the and the uh the sword it's it's neat i even like when they uh the, i like the way the little knight keys look too yeah uh, go ahead <clears throat> good I must say, yeah, those those are definitely made for collectors. Yeah, I don't I don't think that I will buy any. I I did not hate the show, but I feel like uh it could have been a little better, maybe. Well, and and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to bash what you, you're saying about the sh like your opinion. I'm just saying if if you're not used to Sentai, there there are certain things that are just kind of hard to get into because you're more of a common writer guy and coming from common writer to sentai it is kind of a letdown you know you're you're coming from like a better written dramatic show to an obviously pandering to children show yeah i mean i'll keep watching it i mean it, i i enjoyed it enough to watch it next week so but overall the show's fine for what it is it's fine uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about, like, in my final thoughts was the villains seem very diverse and fun, and I like them so far. Because, like, you're, like, the, um, like, the castle dude, 
or Tank Chu and shit. I'm not even gonna try to remember their names right now. But the Castle Dude and the Mushroom Girl thing, like those two look like they do not belong in the same series. Like they look very, very different. No, and I'm still wondering who the leader of the bad guys are. Really? Yeah, because I don't. Think, don't know. I I don't think the Castle Guy was by any means the leader. No. I mean, he's definitely their tank, but he is not the leader. Um, my next thought is, uh, the Masters dying was definitely, like, a holy shit moment for me. I mean, even though you kind of saw it coming, John, I did not. I mean, it was actually kind of impressive to me that they would go down that road. And I really like how their souls are the whole reason the team can morph at all. A passing of the torch thing is definitely, like, pushed hard in that. And it, I think it was really nicely executed. One last point. The Red Ranger is the least Japanese-looking guy I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, his, his facial features are a little bit older, I guess you could say. Not to, I'm sorry, not trying to be racist. No, no butt hurt intended. But usually they're a little bit like angular, more like the Japanese faces aren't as. I don't know. Just, I, I agree with you, John. <laughs> yeah, I was like, who is this guy? Um, another thing I really liked from the episode was the Megazord battle. Like, personally, I thought that was freaking epic. Like I stated before, like, I'm a huge fan of particle effects, and I really, really appreciated the lack of CG during the battle. I mean, there was a little bit of it, but not enough to overwhelm the battle. And, and it didn't seem as clunky as most of the Megazord battles look. And I have never, ever seen a suit actor in a Megazord do half the shit this guy did without using CG. Really enjoyable. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Short and to the point. But if I had one gripe, it's what I've already said about the end of the episode and that forced, forced morph. I was, it just, it was just so off-putting and I didn't, I didn't really, uh, I didn't like it. I don't know. If they did that with, uh, with Tommy whenever he finally became good, they did the, oh, well, we're all together now, might as well morph for no reason, and then the show goes off. Yeah, all right, all right, you got me there. But overall, I liked it, and I'm looking forward to where the show goes. Yeah, we'll see. You're like, I'll give it somewhat of a chance. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna watch it again next week. We'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens after that. Fair enough. All right, on to the next segment entitled Writer Time. Writer. Uh, picking up where we left off in episode two when we were talking about Common Rider, we're talking about Common Rider Zio episode 25. And uh, episode 25 is where we get introduced into another Zio, which we hinted back in uh, our episode two. God, he is creepy looking. He is creepy looking. I will be posting pics of him as screenshots further on in this episode, so look forward to that. But anyways, uh, the episode starts with uh, us seeing the regular star shining, and it's shining closer, which means Omade is coming a hell of a lot sooner than it should. They keep saying that, but I don't know. Well, apparently Omade is supposed to happen in April, and since the show mirrors like the real world time-wise, maybe Omade happens in our little April. Hmm. Maybe. I guess it's only two weeks away. Yeah. I mean, it not, it's not necessarily going to be like the beginning of April, but maybe one of the episodes in April is where we see Oma Day happen. Yeah. That would be kind of cool. I would like that. Maybe, I guess. But anyways, uh, we see this dude who we don't know uh, is going around collecting um, the power of another Riders because the first thing we see is another O's who should be defeated uh, attacking some random dude who is later revealed to be the contract holder of another build, and he steals the power from of another build from this dude, which is kind of weird. I thought it was actually cool that uh, this was happening. Yeah, I, I was liking it so far. I was like, okay, this is intriguing. Where is this going? Black Woes and Sogo pick up on the trail of whoever's doing this, and they go off to try to find what the hell's going on. Um, another build attacks Sogo, and he is defeated by using build armor. But during the explosion of the defeat, he turns into another Egg's Aid. And yeah, uh, I was kind of like, I know they were just kind of building this up a little bit, but hmm. I, I would have thought if he was defeated, he probably would have just became a normal person. Yeah, but um, 
they, they explain why he's switching to another writers rather than just being like, hey, I'm defeated. Yeah, I mean, I, I got it. But at this moment in time, I was like this. So during the fight, uh, Gates appears, and he's just like, holy shit, it's another x -Aid. I thought we defeated him. Quick, Sogo, give me x -Aid's watch. And he's just like, uh, but it's not gonna. She's like, just fucking give it a watch. <laughs> and he turns into x -Aid, uh, armor, and it doesn't fucking work. And he's just like, Sogo tells Gates, uh, yeah, it's, it's not gonna work. He's like, why did you tell me that in the first place? I tried to, but you're a sack of dicks. Basically. <laughs> uh, Poor Gates. So during the fight, Comrade Rose shows up, and he beats him. And uh, we learn that the guy's name is Hiryu, um, and he claims to be destined to defeat Sogo. Pieces out and says, we'll fight again. Now, Sogo has no clue who the fuck this kid is. No, but he's like, you know who I am. He's like, I don't know, bro. It's, uh, yeah, it's like, you just got issues, man. I, I don't know what the hell your beef is. And uh, they find out, like, ride watches just in general don't work on this kid. And uh, at this point, you know, we find out that the only thing that can defeat just, like, literally any ride watch without having – I mean, any – another rider without having to use a particular ride watch is the gate's revive power, which is kind of interesting. And It's, it's pretty OP. Yeah, and we find out Hiryu's uh, next target is another wizard. So uh, Sogo and Black Woes go to guard him. In the meantime, uh, oh, I can't say her fucking name. Say her name for me. Su Sukuyumi. Sukuyumi. I'm going to get it right, I swear. Sukuyumi goes to visit Sogo's uncle to find out more about Hiryu and uh, why he would be you know, focusing on Sogo. So we find out like 10 years ago, Sogo's parents died in a bus accident, and uh, Tsukiyumi researches the accident to find out that Hiryu was in the same accident, accident, and his parents were killed as well. Yeah, she's like just trying to mess up the timelines. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that. But anywho, uh, Sogo was right to follow the another wizard's contract holder because Hiryu shows up, and Sogo saves this guy from Hiryu. Uh, Gates and Woes join the fight, and we find out that Hiryu is actually another Zio. And Which, he, I, I have no idea how they did this. Yeah, well, um, I, I read ahead to, like, what's going on, and apparently now, thanks to another Zio being created, whenever you create another writer, it doesn't, like, destroy the other writer's timeline anymore. I guess anything to push the plot. Whatever. But that's why this dude has access to all of the other another rider's powers. He's basically like a reverse Zeo. Instead of using like normal ride watches, he uses another rider ride watches and gains their powers. Which was neat. Uh, I actually liked it. Yeah, I thought that that's really cool. Like that's an innovative way to make an evil Zeo, and I thought it was very nicely done. And we find out that Sh Schwartz made him to be a reverse. Oma Zio. Like, uh, basically, you, the whole Time Jackers, like, thing was, we want to create our own king to replace Zio. I mean, Oma Zio. And the, the shitty thing is, by using another Zio, technically, he's still a Zio and become Oma Zio. Which I think that he's probably actually Oma Zio. Yeah, uh, that, that's a distinct possibility. And cutting back to the fight, we find out that another Zeo can see into the future, just like uh, Zeo 2's powers. And they start fighting, and blammo, that's where the episode ends. Now, on to the final thoughts of the episode. Alright, on to our final thoughts. John, you wanted to go first? Yeah, uh, I like the Oma Zeo. Not Oma Zeo, but <laughs> <laughs> another Zeo. Uh, I really like his, I guess you would call it a henchin, kind of. Yeah, it seems very henchin-esque. Yeah, he just kind of takes his another ride watch and sticks it in the place of where the Ziku driver would be, and he turns into another Zio. He's got these creepy little teeth, which kind of like, ugh. But <laughs> another blade is pretty creepy looking, too. He's like a 
shriveled up butterfly. Or spoilers, something. spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Oh, uh, whatever. We're not talking about another blade today. We'll talk about that when he shows up. Spoilers. We're, we're spoiling the show right now anyways. All right, all right. I see your point. Well, if you haven't seen episode 25 through 27, which is the episodes we're talking about today, yeah. Spoiler warning, a little late, whatever. Right. But, but uh, <laughs> overall, the episode was really good. A lot of uh, story development. It really, I think it really started to push the uh, show in a direction, a real direction. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think it was really cool to finally find out like what was going on with Songo's parents, or Songo's parents, because I've always wondered – why is he living with his uncle? They never explained that until now. Well, they're dead. I figured they were dead. I mean, they're not. There. I kind of figured they were dead too, but it's also a very like huh? Japanese culture regular thing for just kids' parents to leave them with a relative while they go overseas and make shit tons of money, and they almost never see their parents. Like that's happened in shit tons of animes. That's a very much so a trope over there. Yeah, well, they never mentioned them being a lot like somewhere, so I just assumed they were dead. Yeah, but half the time when we're dealing with a younger writer, they don't mention parents at all. Like, if you look at fours, like Comrade Fours, and those were guys were obvious teenagers, parents were almost never mentioned. Like, it's just a weird thing in superhero shows. They almost never mention t- uh, parents. Yeah, I, I guess. But anyways, on to episode 26. So episode 26 uh, starts where episode 25 left off. With Zeo and uh, another Zeo fighting. And uh, Zeo loses. Like, bad. He gets his ass beat and he gets knocked into a, um, a light pole and just kind of passes the fuck out. It, which makes no sense because they can both see what the other one's about to do. I don't know. Well, we find out later on, I think, in this particular episode that Zeo's power, like another two, Zeo 2's power, which is his upgrade form, is super duper powerful and it can womp pretty much anybody's butt, but when he goes up against another Zeo, he's weak against that. So I think that's why. Because I thought he he beats him up later on. Hmm. I don't think so. Uh, the the one who beats him up is uh, Revive, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure that Zeo beats him up. Zeo beats him up. Then Revive beats him up, and and Woes has beat him up before. Well, Woes beat him up in one. But so far, like in this up to this point in this episode, Woes is the only one who won. Up to this point. But anyways, back to where we are currently. Okay, so Black Woes shows up to check on Songo, and we find out, like I just said, Zeo is weak against another Zeo and will probably continue to lose. So after that explanation, it cuts to Sukiyumi traveling back to twenty uh, two thousand nine to see like what was going on and how Songo's parents died. And uh, she like goes to the hospital where uh, Songo was admitted to check on him. And she witnesses the moment Hiryu uh, swore vengeance on Songo. Because Hiryu like blames, he's like, it's all his fault. It's his fucking fault. My parents are dead. I hate him. <laughs> but, it's, but it's really not his fault. Yeah, but how could that kid know it? I mean, he was on the damn bus. Yeah, well, well, we'll get to that. But anyways, another little side story that's happening while all this is going on is Hiru, I think that's how you pronou- pronounce it, uh, the youngest time jacker, uh, seems to think that in creating another Zeo, Schultz is still making Oma Zeo happen, which is totally the opposite of what the time jackers were set up for. They don't want Oma Zeo to exist in any way. And well, Schultz is kind of like, yeah, he's got some shit going his, on. He's been, doing his, he's been doing his own thing for a long time, so right. who really knows what his... Because he's obviously the bad guy. Yeah, he seems to almost be the big bad. And yeah. But what's interesting about this little exchange is he, he Rue seems to start losing faith in the cause. You know what I mean? Because like, he, even though they're going about it different ways, like Gates, Tsukiyomi, and the Time Jackers all want Omazeo to not happen. And if Omazeo is going to happen due to what Schultz is doing, then, yeah, he's just like, some. I'm not against working with the good guys to fucking stop this shit. This isn't good. Well, his morality has kind of gone downhill since they since uh, Schultz key-kied him. Yeah, because a few episodes ago, like Schultz straight up betrayed the poor little kid and turned him into another key-kai against his will. 
So n now we're worrying about like what Tsukiyomi is doing in the past. And I remember you were laughing about this, John, about like how Tsukiyomi and Gates are talking on the freaking phone through time. Yeah, I was like, man, these things got hell of service. Verizon ain't got nothing on them. <laughs> yeah, because uh, they have this phone loosely based off Common Rider Fize's phone. And apparently it has the ability to talk to people through time. So as long as somebody else has one of these phones, no matter where they are in the timeline, they can talk as if they're at the same point. And while Gates is on the phone with Tsukiyomi, uh, Hiru uh, confronts Gates, trying to figure out where Tsukiyomi went, because, like I said, he's really starting to distrust the, their whole operation, and he wants to see what the good guys are doing to possibly help them. But Gates doesn't trust him at all, and he basically tells him to fuck off. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't trust him either. Yeah, well, yeah, they, they kind of have a history, but it, I think if any of the three of those guys is remotely trustworthy or might actually help them anyway, it's this kid. I know, even the chick is like, screw this little kid over. Yeah, like, I, I sure as fuck don't trust her. She seems evil as all hell, too. But she doesn't seem to be nearly as ambitious as Schultz is. No, I just think she hasn't got screwed over by him yet, so she doesn't care what happens. Pretty much. So, cut back to Sogo, and he's still trying to save another wizard contract holder, because he goes back to uh, the restaurant where another wizard's contract holder was chilling. And yeah, he's been stalking this guy, and yeah. I'm like, you probably would like be in jail right now or yeah. something like that here in America for like stalking this guy around, because like, he literally chases him down the street. Yeah, because like, in the last episode, like when they were trying to protect the dude, they were just chilling at this dude's restaurant where he works as like a restaurant magician, and they made him really, really uncomfortable. And he's just like, ah, "Yeah, I'm gonna go." <laughs> well, he uh, Sango puts two and two together and realizes since this guy was another wizard, where he met him in the first place was the original like um, magic theater where he practiced his magic. So he rushes off to that theater to try to find this guy, and of course he gets there too late and here you already gets the power of another wizard and at this point sango is getting more than fed up and he's just like dude what is your beef what do you why do you have a problem with me and he tells sango you're the reason my parents died which is weird was because he's seen what happened on the on the uh the bus at, at, well eh, he did but he didn't Cause like well, was, was he frozen in time? No, no I'm going to get to that because that's I think that's either part of this episode or the next one. But anyways, uh -huh. he says that on the day his parents died, a woman in white, presumably Tsukiyomi, um, was on the bus yelling Sango's name. And uh, they start fighting. And meanwhile, Gates goes back to 2009 as well to check on the incident that killed Sango and uh, Kiryu's uh, parents. A gate sees Tsukiyomi on the bus, so it was for sure her, and apparently she dies in the explosion that killed, you know, both those kids' parents. Yep, and then Gates gets all, my sister's dead. Yeah, isn't, or they're not related. You know, basically. Yeah. And after seeing this, uh, Gates finally has enough uh, resolve that to kill Zeo, unlocking Re Re Revive's power and finally becoming... Gates revive brawn form, which is like this really awesome, like orange form that's like big and beefy and bulky. And uh, I, I thought he looked pretty cool. And he, gets, he looked sick. Yeah, and he gets a new weapon that is like this, like, like knuckle type chainsaw thing. Chainsaw. Yeah, yeah, chainsaw knuckle thing, and uh, it's fucking stupid, beefy, and powerful. And one thing I really liked, and I think you did too, John, was uh, White Woes appears and takes a page from Black Rose's book and announces Gates' new form to the world in all its grandeur. <laughs> yeah. Well, the best of that happens in the next episode, so... Yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, so he makes short work of another Zeo, and the only reason another Zeo survived at all was because Schultz came in at the last second, stopped time, and I know this upset you whenever they do this, John, and uh, <laughs> saved him. It does. Every... I like... But the 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 further this goes on, mm -hmm. the the more I understand why he isn't just killing him because 
obviously he wants everything to happen. Everything that's happening, Schultz wants to happen. I I I can't disagree with you. Like it, it seems like he he has set this shit in motion since they were kids practically. Oh shit! Spoilers. Never mind. We'll get back to that. But yeah, he has set this shit in motion since the beginning. That's what it. That's what it feels like. Yeah, for sure. But um, cutting back to the fight between Gates Revive and Zo Two, uh, it, it's pretty evenly matched for the most part. Like it doesn't seem like either one of them's winning. And then Sango's like, "Okay, I'm getting tired of this." He starts to do his final attack, and at that moment, Gates Revive reveals he has another form called Gates Revive Shimpu or Whirlwind form that makes Whirlwind, him, yeah. that makes him go stupid freaking fast. And at this point, Revive apparently, is apparently faster than time. Yeah, uh, I, I guess he can go faster than even the Time Jackers at this point. And Revive is just whomping Zio's ass hard. And while all this is going on, they decide to cut back to the bus station where um, we see Woes, had, Black Woes, excuse me, has knocked out literally everyone there. And this is current time. And he's looking into the records of the crash of the bus to see, like, who the passengers were trying to find stuff out like Tsukiyumi was, except for he can't travel back in time. He doesn't have a time machine, so he's just using, like, regular old modern-day detective skills. I, I don't understand how the fuck he knocked everybody out, though. That's not really well explained. Yeah, it it's not I, I, at all. It just kind of happens. I, we can just assume Woes has some abilities. And, so anyways, he's reading the passenger list, and he's trying to figure out who was there, and he sees, okay, Hiryu was there, and so was Hiryu's parents, and so was Son Sogo's parents. And then he sees something that's like, hello? He sees... Sukasa's name, aka Kamarada Decade's name, among the pasture list, and he's like, what the fuck was Sukasa doing there? Yeah, uh, didn't you, because, uh, in the intro, or maybe it's the outro, you see Decade in, like, an outfit where he looks like he's a bus driver or something like that. Yeah, in the preview for the next episode, and, and, and we'll get to that in a second. So anyways, uh, the episode ends with Revive and Zo2 fighting. Kind of like where the episode began, come to think of it, with, like, uh, Zio fighting somebody. So, on to the final thoughts of this episode. So, I feel the story is really picking up, and the lack of focus on old school writers gives the current team the spotlight, and I feel they've needed it. And I feel they're using this opportunity really well. Um... I feel we get a decent backstory and more twists and turns, and as a first, for my knowledge at least, no common writer cocktease, as the fandom calls it. And what I mean by that is normally when they're teasing in the next episode there'll be a new form or whatever like that, they show it at the very, very end, they don't show anything of it, and there's not even a fight scene, and instead... But the previews, though. Yeah, the previews. Well, like, they, they're known for doing this. Like, they did it in Kamen Rider um, Build twice. Like, when they first introduced Hazard Form, they did the classic Kamen Rider pack tease. Like, he, he transforms at the very, very end of the episode. All we see is the transformation. Boom. Episode over. They did that again when he went Genius Form. Yeah. So that's very much so a Kamen Rider trope where it's just like they tease this new form and then they don't give it to you till the very very end of the show and that's it they just show it to you for like a second boom story over so it was nice to see him go revive and then get to see like the majority of what revive can do i think they did that very well and it it was it was more rewarding i think and speaking of revive i really like the way he looked yes he's one of the better looking riders i think his gimmick is Really cool, I like how the hourglass works, where he, he flips it over and he changes forms. I've been waiting to see him. We were waiting forever because they didn't spoil, like, they spoiled so much, like, way before, you know, it came out, but we had to wait till, like, what, the week before uh, Revive came out before we actually knew what he looked like? Yeah, and I, I was freaking out about that, too, because, like, we damn near saw Zio's final form before we saw Gates Revive. <laughs> It was just yeah, like, we're, good we're God. Crazy. And I, I really like how he has two modes. Like, that's very reminiscent of almost like Kamen Rider Kabuto. Like, it even feels kind of Kamen Rider Kabuto-esque because, like, Kabuto had an armored form 
and then a more sleek, skinnier form that made him faster. Yeah. One thing I'm really interested to see in the next episode is what the hell is Tsukasa doing on that bus? I, I th- Go ahead. Yeah, I kind of wonder that that too. Well, I remember but. when this first aired, like, me and you were freaking the fuck out. Like, we kept re-watching and re-watching the preview, like, desperately trying to uh, find, like, little clues and stuff of what was going on. We were breaking it down. We're like, what the hell anything? <laughs> Basically. Like, and me and John have never done that. I, I don't think there's been a point in Zio that we've been so excited to see the next episode. Yeah, because uh, a, a lot of stuff happened. There was a lot of answers. And it was basically the first, you know, what, the first two-part episode. Well, no, the, I guess the this one and the next episode are the two parts where they didn't conclude, you know, the conclusion didn't happen. Right, because, like, that is another uh, very common writer trope that they started back in early 2000s where it's uh, – Every story was self-contained within, like, two episodes. Like, it almost felt like it was an hour-long story broken up into two parts. And, that, like I said, that became a regular trope for each, like, little story bit. Instead of having um, the monster of the week, they had the monster of a two-week. And they're not doing that right now. They're doing, like, this elongated, drawn-out story going into the third week now of another Zeo. And that's really, in my opinion, more intriguing and more like, okay, I got to see the next episode. Where is it going to go? Uh, I mean, I guess I'm still kind of new to Kamen Rider, so I've always kind of been used to that whole scenario. They don't usually uh, do it like this. Like I said, there, there's a formula and they're, they're – like they, they kept the formula at the beginning, you know, where it's like each, oh, yeah. you know, each legendary writer got his own two-episode story arc. But since this another Zeo story arc started – now it's like all bets are off. Yeah, uh, I kind of feel like they're gonna backtrack here a little bit based off the uh, previews. Yeah, we've seen for stuff. Yeah, for another blade and stuff. But anyways, let's go on to episode twenty-seven. So picking up right where the last episode left off, we see Gates revive and Zo two fighting, only to be interrupted by Black Woes. To stop the battle altogether, he teleports Gates away from the battle and warns him about the risks of using Gates' revived power, basically telling him that if he keeps using it, he will die. And what he means is, when he uses the power, he compresses it. He compresses time and stretches time. For like brawn time, for like his brawn orange form, he's compressing time to make himself like stronger and more beefy and more defensive. And he's stretching time, you know, slowing it down to uh, go faster with his uh, whirlwind form. But this is wreaking havoc on his body. And proof in the pudding is, like, we cut to um, Gates and he has a nosebleed. Yeah, and it's kind of weird that no one ever told him that was going to happen. This was going to happen because it seemed like they knew. Yeah, and and I have such a crazy theory about that that we're going to get into in just a second. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you about this, John. This is something I've been waiting to talk to you about. I was like, I want to tell them. I want to tell them so bad, but I got to say before the episode. I got to make it genuine. <laughs> but we learned the reason that Gates finally decided to use Gates' revive power and has become hellbent on actually defeating Zio for real this time. Is he feel like since he hesitated, Tsukiyomi took matters into her own hands. And because of his hesitation... That's why she died in the bus explosion. So he's just like, he's doing this essentially to avenge Tsukiyumi. Okay, oh, I guess we'll talk about it a little bit. No, go ahead. I mean, she didn't die. Yeah, she didn't die. Foreshadowing, whatever. Well, that, we find that out later in the episode. She didn't die. But um, Yeah, I, I figured Woes might, might have figured that out. You know what I mean? I don't see that. I don't think, because he doesn't know. He doesn't know what Gates knows about her presumably dying in the bus crash. She wasn't listed know. in the passenger I don't list. Know. I can't really guess what I guess I can't really guess what Woes ever knows because he'll just pop up and he'll say something like, "Well, why the fuck didn't you tell us this before?" Yeah, you're right. I mean, he does have that book, but the book is becoming less and less accurate with all the crazy shit going on. Yeah, but I wonder if he's like just lying. I don't know. But uh, having enough of black wolves and not caring about the risks. Uh, Gates goes revive and beats the ever-living crap out of Woes to the point of even using, like, his weapons on an unpensioned yeah. dude. He could have killed Black Woes. 
But yeah, just let you know how badass Woes is. Yeah. But uh, in walks in White Woes, and he commends Gates on his victory and the use of the revive wa- uh, Gates watch. Um, and uh, Gates is just like, you know what? GTFO. I want nothing to do with you. And he and at this moment, White Woes does something that kind of gets me like, huh? Because he says something that's very curious to me as Gates is walking off, you know, after he told White Woes to F off. He's like, you are truly a savior for us, that is. And I was like, what? And this gets into my crazy ass fucked up theory. You ready for this shit, John? Yep. White Woes is Black Woes. They're the same person. Now, hear well, me I out. Said that. I kind of said that earlier. Well, hear me out. Here's why I think that is now. Because Gates Revive Watch will eventually kill Gates. And by pushing so damn hard for him to become Gates Revive, it was all to eventually kill Gates. Maybe. I mean, I don't know about that part. But I, well, I have mean, thought that it's White Woes obvious. and Black Woes were the same. It's obvious that White Woes knows that the Gates Revive Watch will kill Gates. He knows that. There's no way he didn't fucking know that. Oh, yeah. I mean, he says I – mean, what what Woes says? It's, it's messing you up, bro. Black Woes. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I mean, still, it, I don't think that mattered. Even if he knew that from the beginning, he would still use it, so. <sighs> I, I I don't know. I, I'm there, There's more to that theory, too, and, and we'll get to that here in a minute. So, uh, Sogo goes home to see his uncles trying to rent out the rooms where Gates and Tsukiyomi used to stay. Because uh, at the beginning of the series, like, Gates and Tsukiyomi were staying in Sogo's house to keep a closer eye on him to make sure he wouldn't go Oma. Well, you know, after they basically turned to 180 and uh, Zio got Zio 2 powers and they're just like, no, he needs to die now, everybody left because they're just like, nah, it's getting too real. Yep. And um, during this... Uh, Black Woes goes to visit the Time Jackers to help, ask for help in defeating Gates. Hora tells him to fuck off, but Hiryu, uh, he, uh, Blue Kid, we're gonna call him Blue Kid because I'm sick of trying to pronounce his name. Blue Kid isn't as sure. He he doubts in their goal. His, his doubts in their general like what we're trying to do here become even more apparent. During all this, we cut back to Hiryu, who confronts Gates, saying he will be the one to defeat Songo. And those two start fighting. Uh, Gates Revive kicks another Zio's ass very, very easily. But Gates is forced to demorph right after defeating him due to Revive's power now making him bleed from the ear. So it's getting progressively worse every time he morphs. Honestly, I they've done this in the, the past with different henshins where it's just like there's a huge, huge cost to them henshining. And... Um, I don't know if they're gonna like cheese it and just be like, yeah, he's fine after that so long, but I I don't I I, I don't know I I kind of maybe hope they'll kill him. Maybe like they there's a lot of stuff that's happening that surprising me so I don't we'll know. See. Yeah, I, I'm fairly certain they're gonna pull the whole shit of like, oh yeah, he's fine now. Cause yeah, it, probably. Yeah. Oh, we purified the revive watch. Yeah, yeah, something crazy like that. But anyways, Blue Kid comes to help the defeated Hiryu, offering uh, assistance, which is actually part of Black Woes' plan. By his assistance, he kind of tricks Hiryu into enacting Black Woes' plan. So Hiryu starts taking the another ride watches he's created and just seemingly making random people become another riders to basically make an army. And... Unlike the original and other writers, they're not conscious of what's going on. They're just basically mindless monsters at this point doing whatever another Zeo wants them to do. I kind of like this, though. It's uh, different. Yeah, and, and, and I like it, too. I mean, it's it's kind of like, okay, well, this is another ability that apparently just another Zeo has. And it Makes you wonder if Zeo can just shove the other watches and other people and do the same thing. What, you just make another Gaim or something? Just make another... No, I mean, it's like, make Gaim. Take the guy I'm watching, just shove it to somebody. He's guy. That'd be cool. That I would it like would that. That would be really cool. So while he's making these slaves and shit, we cut to Sogo, who gets a text from Gates telling him to meet up with him for the final showdown. Now just to hold on for a second, let's let's take a look at that. 
he gets a text from Gates, who doesn't have the cell phone. Is anybody else I, freaking out about this? He does have a phone. He has that feature phone, and maybe he can text. No, dude. No, that. Okay. Okay. Fine. Whatever. It just it freaked me out. I was he just can like, call across time. I'm sure he can send a text. <sighs> fine. Well, after he gets that text, we see a tender moment between Sogo and his uncle. Um, his uncle. Yeah, that's probably the like the most genuine moment of the entire show. Yeah, because his uncle is actually kind of my favorite character because he's the most real. You know what I mean? Like everybody and else seems to be a character, but his uncle just seems to be a normal dude. Yeah. But his uncle goes on basically saying, like, ever since, like, Sogo's parents died, like, he's never punished him, he's never yelled at him, he's basically let the kid do whatever, and he tells him, you need to stop being so go-lucky and pretending like nothing's bothering you, and that you're not hurting, and that you're not lonely, that Tsukiyomi and Gates left, and that you're not upset about the fact that you don't have any friends and shit like that. He's just like, if you're lonely, fucking say you're lonely. If you're upset, say you're upset. You don't have to keep hiding this shit. You don't have to re keep pretending like everything's okay. And and like you said, that felt very very genuine to me. Yeah, he kind of he doesn't really yell at him, but he's like kind of. I mean, I wouldn't say he yelled at him, but he was real. Yeah, it felt really cool. So after that tender moment, uh, they flash back to the day Sogo and Hiryu's parents died. Apparently, uh, everybody who was on that bus was part of a family event of like parents and their kids going to a strawberry picking tour, which is kind of cool. I would have loved to do something like that when I was a kid. That's pretty freaking awesome. How about you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess it would be nice. Sorry, I guess I'm just a tool because I would think. Come on, man, wouldn't that be cool? Like there was. Oh well, maybe not. No. <laughs> I mean, not if my family got murdered. Okay, I see your point. Point made. <laughs> So, like, while everybody's getting on the bus, one of the last people to get on the bus is Tsukiyomi, setting up what we've already seen with Gates. And as she's getting on the bus, who's driving the bus? But fucking Sakuya. Uh, Tatsu. Decay. Decay is driving the damn bus. What the didn't hell? Even notice. Yeah, she just walked right past him like it was nothing. She was so she focused. Was like, nothing to see here. It's just like she was so focused on child Sogo that she just totally negated the fact that the decayed is driving the bus, which they still haven't fucking explained yet. So no. they're, they're driving to the strawberry picking tour. And as they're driving there, Schultz shows up dressed like a normal person, which is weird. He's not dressed in his regular time jack or garb. He's just dressed. He's got a nice little top hat on. Yeah, he's just dressed like a normal dude. And he uses his time decker powers to stop the bus. And he gets on the bus, and he claims that one of the kids on that bus – well, actually, all the kids on that bus are candidates for becoming the next king because they were born in the year 2000. And I was like, oh, shit's getting a little bit wonky now. So he takes control of the bus, making it go out of control. And Sukasa is desperately trying to regain control, and he basically realizes he's flubber enough. He can't make the truck – uh, the bus do anything he wants it to and just sits there and lets it happen so during this time schultz makes time stop for all the adults except for sukasa because sukasa is special and uh, at this point like young songos sogo is getting pissed he, he confronts schultz like gets up in his face and is like what the fuck are you doing and sukiyumi trying to save sogo you know basically enacts the whole scene that makes hiryu think that um it's Sogo's fault that his parents died. She pulls out her gun, says Sogo, shoots at Schwartz, and Schwartz deflects the bullet. Now, when he deflects the bullet, he knocks out Hiryu. So from there on, Hiryu doesn't know anything else that happens. Oh, yeah. That's it shot why. the it shot the arm of the chair, and it knocked the kid out. What a weakling. But either way, that's why he doesn't remember, and he doesn't know what happened, because the moment he, he doesn't wake up until everything's oh, oh. done. Schultz takes all the kids and teleports away. And we see him open like a time portal, so he's obviously not just teleporting away. He's teleporting through time with all the kids. Uh, the bus goes out of control, slamming into a tunnel and exploding. And right before the explosion, Tsukasa creates a dimension wall thing from Decay that was very prevalent in Decay and takes him and Tsukiyumi out of there. Now, here's the shitty thing. He saves himself and Tsukiyumi, but he lets... Every last one of those kids' parents die. 
I'm like, <laughs> sure damn does, doesn't he? Yeah, because it's like you can't tell me he couldn't have saved all those, you know, parents as well. But he's just like, mm, I'll just save myself from the lowly over here. Right. We cut to the next scene where all the kids are dropped off um, in like this crumbling city, and it's apparently Oma Day. You know, when Omazio arrives and all his like mechs awaken, because apparently he has mechs hidden throughout the city, and they're just destroying the city. The kids start freaking out. And we find out that Tsukasa brought him and Tsukiyumi right to that time, too, following in Schwartz's footsteps. Cut to the present, and we see White Woes is getting ambushed by the Another Riders Hiryu created. Turns out it was a trap to steal White Woes' power. But White Woes ain't having that, and he uses his cheat boat book, you know, the one he can write in to make, like, literally any fucking thing happen. Any fucking thing. Yeah. And he basically writes, uh, Kamen Rider Woes' powers get returned to Woes. But Black Woes uses this as an opportunity to trick the book and steal the power right before it got to White Woes. Because the thing is, technically the powers got returned to Woes, it just didn't say which version. And then he got salty as hell. Oh yeah, but still, the reason... Now this leads back into my theory where Black Woes is White Woes. Just by through some effed up time paradox, the whole reason White Woes has powers is because Black Woes stole them in the past. Hmm? What do you think? Mm, maybe. I think. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. I'm sure. It, if that is a thing, they will tell us. It connects the dots pretty hard there, bro. Yeah. Black Woes uses his newfound powers as a common writer to take on uh, Gates Revive because. His whole thing, the whole reason he stole the powers is because he is a very loyal, loyal servant of Omazeo. And he wants Gates out of the picture now because Gates has made it abundantly clear he wants to kill Zeo. And in true Blackwell's fashion, the moment he henshins for the first time, he, <laughs> he announces his ascension into being a common writer in true Woe's fashion. It's fucking fantastic. It's the best one. It's the best one by far. Yeah, it's really great. So uh, Black Woes and Revive start fighting, and the last thing we see is Sogo uh, on his bike going to meet up at the location that Gates sent him to for the final showdown. So with the episode ended, now on to final thoughts. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, Revive killing Gates is an interesting twist, although not um, common for common writers. You know, like like I stated earlier, there has been other powers that were, like, very, very detrimental to the user. Like, even in the last uh, series, like, uh, Build, you know, they said uh, if you henshined more than once in a day, it was very, very detrimental to your body. Or, like, when, um, like, Cross got his um, squ jelly upgrade, like, you saw it kept on hurting him really, really bad every time he henshined. And eventually, like... I'm assuming they're going to do with this. He got over it, and he overcame it. Yeah, uh, we'll see. I'm not 100% sure on that. I mean, it's kind of hard to say they could go either way with it. I mean, like I said, well, and I don't might die. Well, I don't see them, like, having him not use the powers for at least a little while. I mean, they got him to sell them toys, man. They got to sell them toys. So he's going to use it for a while, but uh, there is this distinct chance they could kill him off. It'd be kind of... I mean, they did it in, like... Cool, right? I mean, they they killed off riders and build. Yeah. Um, I still stand by my uh, statement that uh, black wolves and white wolves are the same person. Uh, black wolves I mean, could be. Well, black wolves getting the rider powers pushes me to believe this even more so. And another thing is, what the fuck is going on with Schultz and and Decade and Omade? Like, he, I don't know. We'll have to figure that out well, on, uh, in a couple of days here. <laughs> Well, I still feel like he's the true mastermind behind the series. Like, if he really did set up Sogo to become Zeo, then he is the whole start for everything. Well, in the first episode, you do see the guy in the hat. Right. Which would obviously, Schultz. So why would Schultz push for Sogo to become Zeo so hard unless he is also working for Oma Zeo? Maybe. I mean, it's, they got a lot of... Uh crazy stuff going on it's hard to say really well and another thing i'm really interested to see 
in the next episode is like Decade's explanation of why he was there. Like what is what is his whole purpose for being in this? And uh, it's just so much drama, so much intrigue. This is why Common Rider is a soap opera for men. Yeah, I guess that's true. But yeah, that'll finish up Rider time. And that'll end our episode for today. Um, sorry I haven't been too good on the whole weekly thing. Uh, I work a lot, and keeping the schedule is not easy, especially considering I'm the only one who edits this. John. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's I cool. Don't lead, don't have lead skills like you. Well, I, I appreciate you just being a part of this show. It's it's a lot more fun being able to do this with somebody than just talking to myself. That makes sense. <laughs> I don't think the show would be nearly entertaining if it was just me bullshitting for like an hour or so. And, right. And it looks like this episode's going to be an hour again after I said I didn't want to do that. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully this will be the last one because we're all cut up now. So. Well, even so, like this one wasn't nearly as taxing as the Super Sentai battle was. Like that one, that one kicked my ass. This one will actually be kind of fun to make, I think. True. And in the next episode, we'll we'll keep the regular format now. We'll talk about Zeo. We'll talk about Ryu Soldier. Um, maybe we'll talk about uh, a video game or a movie. And in a couple weeks, we're going to be doing a semi-live podcast uh, because I'll be down in Georgia visiting John. Yeah, it'll be uh, good stuff. So the sound quality might be a little bit better <laughs> because <laughs> we won't be talking through like uh, a, a Facebook app or something. We'll be in the same damn room. <laughs> So that's something to look forward to, guys, and uh, we will definitely see you guys in the next video. And, oh, before I go, just so you guys know, uh, if you ever want any updates of what's going on with Joel Manis in general, I always update on Facebook first, uh, link in the description, and um, like, comment, subscribe, all that fun shit. And, John, I'm assuming you have nothing you want to pimp, right? No. All right. Well, we will see you guys in the next episode. Hadouces. Later.